Recording. Okay, let's start today's seminar. This speaker is Professor Hesong Lee from KAIST. He will talk about the interesting topic, Egypt Quintessence. Uh, please start when you're ready. Okay, hey, so hello, thank you. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, my pleasure to give this seminar. So I want to talk about the gauge the quintessence model that I built with Kunio Kaneta, Jian Li, and Jeo Gi last year. Although the basic part of this uh, model is uh, um, published here, we are still working on various interesting parts of the model. The Jeo Gi and Jian are here online, so the, my personal thanks to them for helping me a lot preparing this talk. Uh, they did the real work, not, not me. So let's just see where we are in terms of the universe energy budget and how well we understand them. There are 5% ordinary matter, which we understand. They are the standard water particles and we discover them. So we understand them well. There are 27% dark matter and there are global competition in the detection of the dark matter in many ways including the direct searches, indirect searches, collider searches. And there are 68% uh, dark energy, and it's the least understood part so far. And uh, practically the most studied about the dark energy part is basically the gravitational effect of the dark energy, the expansion rate at the different redshifts. And uh, in my view, um, uh, in some sense, it is the symmetry that makes this difference. In the standard model, we have the SU3, SU2, U1 gauge symmetries that allow us all the standard model interactions. And in the dark matter sector, there are plenty of symmetries suggested. And things like the U1 dark gauge symmetry that might have a kinetic mixing with the U1 hypercharge, or U1 Pechakin global symmetry for the action dark matter, or just the standard model weak interaction like the Suji dark matter scenarios. And the many of these dark matter studies, both theoretical and experimental, employ some non-gravitational interactions, mostly associated with some symmetries. But what about here? The reason dark energy sector does not have many active researches nowadays might have something to do with a lack of sufficient studies of the symmetries in the dark energy sector. Yes, that's what I think. So lately, we constructed a model named the gauge the quintessence. The quintessence is the first dark energy field model with a single scholar introduced by Latrine Peebles in 1988. And our work, the gauge the quintessence, is the first model that introduced the gauge symmetry in this quintessence color model. Okay, so why do we care about the gauge symmetry for the dark energy sector? Uh, if there is no better reason, uh, I think we can look back the history and we can learn the introduction or the discovery of the new particles were often followed by a new gauge symmetry. But the new, I mean, the neutrino was first postulated by Pauli in 1930 to explain the energy spectrum in the beta, de beta decay. And the weak interaction was formulated by Fermi, which turned out to be the SA2 gauge interaction later. The quark model was uh, proposed by Gelman and independent by Zweig in 1964 to explain the plethora of the hadrons. And the SU3 gauge interaction among the quarks was proposed by Han and Nambu in the following year. So if the history repeats or rhymes, a new gauge symmetry might have something to do with a new dark matter particle, as well as the new dark energy field, the quintessence color. And just like the SU2 and the SU3 did, a new gauge symmetry may help us understand the dark sector particles or the fields. So here's a brief outline for the rest of my talk. 
first we're gonna um, take a very quick overview of the quintessence model. And then we wanna present our gauge the quintessence model. And a little discussion about the coherent dark gauge version in this model and discuss how it affects the evolution of the universe. Then we will um, make a little remark on the Hubble tension. I mean, our uh, model's implication on the Hubble tension issue before the summary. Okay, so let's take a brief look at the quintessence. Um, it is the dynamic dark energy model with a scalar field of phi and the scalar rolls down the potential slowly in the present universe. Rachel and Peebles introduced a couple of uh, potentials for uh, this quintessence scalar. Uh, one of them is this uh, inverse power potential that is exponentially decreasing potential. And this kind of potential, um, as you can see, is the phenomenological potential not meant to be the sophisticated renormalizable potential. And each potential energy is identified as the dark energy. And there's a tracking behavior in this quintessence. That is the phi initial value does not really matter. Only the potential itself determines the present time value of the phi and its equation of state. Thus addressing the cosmological coincidence problem. And because the energy density scales differently for different kinds of species, it would be very difficult to make the size of the present time dark energy density comparable to the matter density uh, without this kind of mechanism. This is the Einstein action for the uh, quintessence field with the FLRW metric. It's a richest color, kinetic term, and the virtual people's potential. The mass of the quintessence is given by the second derivative of the potential. And since the phi lowers down the potential, the quintessence mass changes, it's actually decreasing for a runaway natural people's potential. And this is the equation of motion. Um, as the quintessence lowers down the potential, this uh, term, the Hubble term, is acting as the friction in the quintessence motion. Using the, uh, using the energy momentum tensor, we can um, get the pressure and the energy density of the quintessence field. And the, their ratio, which is called the equation of state, or W, uh, is an important quantity because it can tell you how the, how the energy density scales. Yes. And since the dark energy is supposed to explain the accelerated expansion, the W must be less than minus one over three. And it is actually minus one for the, um, the lambda CDM, or if the condition completely stops. But because of this kinetic term, W is actually a little larger than minus one. So say between minus one and the minus one over three in the quintessence color model. Now for the quintessence to explain the dark energy in the late universe, uh, there are some conditions it should satisfy at the present time. That is, its potential energy should be um, that of the present dark energy density, which is about 10 to the minus 47 GeV to the fourth. And uh, its mass should be comparable to the Hubble constant uh, to ensure the slow law. Now this plot shows the tracking behavior of the quintessence that I mentioned before. The balancing between the potential slope and the Hubble friction results in the common tracking solution for the quintessence. The present values are not really sensitive to its initial values, but it's only the shape of the potential that determines the nowadays um, values and the equation of state. 
So if the Trojan initial value is small, smaller than the tracking solution, the slope, it means slope is steeper, right? And the file loads faster and it catches up the, the tracking solution. If the Trojan initial value is large, then it can be frozen a little and then join later to the tracking solution. So you can see no matter where it started, if the alpha equals same, I mean, alpha basically is the shape of the potential. If the alpha equals same uh, in the late universe, they are the same, the tracking. And the equation of state also is the same, uh, no matter where they started, which is about minus 0.7-ish in this plot, in this example. Okay, so... Uh can I ask a question? Sure. For me, three. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry. So, could you remind me the benefit of quintessence model? Benefit of the quintessence model? Yeah, I understand. If we can consider this kind of yeah time dependent scalar field. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So, what's the benefit or advantage to consider? I think it is actually the. Of the tracking solution, I mean, the basically cosmological coincidence problem. Mm -hmm. uh, without the tracking, uh, it should be the extreme fine tuning to make the uh, energy density of the dark energy part and the energy density of the dark matter part comparable in the present universe. It should be extreme fine because they scale differently and the mm -hmm. universe has large scale changes. So I if, I have to, if, if I have to take one, I would say the, that's the tracking behavior. But there is actually the another thing uh, which I don't really understand. I mean, the, in the string theory field that there is an argument that, uh, uh, I mean, the, what's the name? And the Fafa and the, those people actually the argue that the universe cannot have the stable, the city universe, but actually the, mm -hmm. so, so they sort of supported the dynamic uh, dark energy, like the quintessence, but uh, frankly, I don't really follow their arguments. So I can look up. As a phenomenologist, I think the tracking behavior is important. So will you also talk about the dark matter part? Say again? Will you also talk about the dark matter in the next slide? Am I going to talk about dark matter? Uh, yes, at some point, yes. Okay. Yeah, great. So uh, we introduced this uh, uh, dark U1 gauge symmetry. Uh, people usually use the dark U1 for the some gauge symmetry for the dark matter sector, but here it is for the dark energy part. Okay. So in order to improve the U1 gauge symmetry, because we need to promote the quintessence to us, complex color and the real part will be the quintessence color and the phase part the eta will be the longitudinal component of the dark gauge version x which means the quintessence in this model is the dark higgs version that gives a mass to the dark gauge version this is the einstein action for the gauge quintessence model um, and the this part, which we call gauge potential, is the basically G, or half gx squared phi squared x mu x mu. Uh, it is given by the minimal coupling from the gauge invariance, and this is, is the crucial part of this model. So the mass of the uh, x gauge version is given by the quintessence color value at the time. And the mass of the phi, the mass of the quintessence is also altered by this gauge potential. And the, uh, throughout the example, we will take the uh, V0, the original potential, uh, the, the inverse power natural people's potential for, for the convenience. Okay, so as the quintessence phi lowers down the potential, uh, both phi mass and the x mass change over the cosmic evolution. And the for a runaway potential, phi value is increasing, which means mx is uh, increasing. 
while the M Y is decreasing. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so in the last slide, you uh, included the inter interaction between the phi and the gauge bosons, but I mean, as phi is a scalar, so there will also be interaction with Higgs, right? Like Higgs, I mean, H dagger H phi square. You mean the standard model Higgs? Yes. Oh, um, I mean, mm -hmm. one can one can think about the mixing of the double H and this of Y, but uh, we are not considering that it's we're just uh, I mean, am, am I following your question? That, did I answer your question? So I'm saying uh, the, this uh, H dagger H, I mean, if H is a standard model Higgs, then H dagger H phi square is also gauge invariant term. Oh, um, well, you can think about the double H, I guess, um, but the, this is a this is a single it. I mean, this is not the stem model Higgs boson. You can think about some the twisted version of the model involving the stem model Higgs version, but that's not what it considered. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. And okay, now this is the equation of motion for the phi and x. And because of this gauge potential, which couples the phi and x, these two equations of motion are coupled. And the uh, energy momentum tensor will give you the pressure and the, uh, the energy density of the phi and x fluid. And if you look at this Boltzmann equations for the phi and x, they are also coupled. And uh, Sorry. You can see that uh, there is a mx dot, uh, which is the uh, which means the the mass of the x and the x gauge boson mass is, uh, uh, is changing over the time. Yes, and uh, this Boltzmann equation is useful to see there's an energy flow between the quintessence color and the dark gauge boson, which is proportional to this uh, mx dot. And if mx dot is positive, which means if x mass is increasing, there is energy flow from the quintessence to the dark gauge boson. If the mass is decreasing, there is energy flow from the dark gauge boson to the quintessence. And the, uh, while the original potential, the Rotra Peebles runaway potential, uh, gives you the repulsive force which pushes the phi to the larger value. This gauge potential, because of its shape, uh, gives you the attractive potential, which pushes you the opposite direction. Right? And the net potential is the sum of the original potential and the gauge potential. And this gauge potential is actually uh, rather shifted away as the time goes by. And uh, I will get, get back to this point uh, later. Okay, the quantum correction. We wanna, we wanna consider the quantum correction. Uh, we wanna basically the, take the Rochelle Peebles as the classical potential, and take the quantum correction using the one loop effective potential. So this is equivalent to the effect of the sum of all one loop diagrams. And uh, this part is uh, just the uh, one loop correction of the quintessence model itself. And this part, is the additional one loop correction because of this dark gauge version. Now the, the quintessence mass squared, which is the, um, the second derivative of this effective potential is now L to the following these terms, yes. Now, if you remember, uh, there are conditions for the quintessence dark energy, quintessence field should satisfy to be the dark energy. That's the present time, the dark energy density, and the slow roll condition, the M5 comparable to the Hubble constant. So we want to apply this condition to this uh, one loop effective potential and the one loop corrected mass to get some constraints on the parameters. Okay. So we want to um, you want to require each term actually satisfy this condition being conservative. 
And if you look at these last terms of the potential and the mass, you can see, I mean, you cannot see any V0 here, which means these last terms are independent of the original potential V0. And it's all just a function of the uh, GX and the MX. So we can constrain these parameters using the conditions for the conditions to be a dark energy. So here it is. This is the coupling. This is the mass of the gauge version. And this uh, reddish part is the constrained part by the quantum correction. The coupling is so small that the, it is still within the weak gravity conjecture. It's because the mass of the quintessence is uh, even smaller. I mean, it's just so tiny. So there are uh, this is a blank region which are allowed by the quantum corrections and the weak gravity conjecture. So this uh, blank region is uh, generally allowed, and this uh, blue band is the solution of the bachelor people's potential case, which shows the tracking behavior. Okay, now you want to talk about a little about the dark age version in the early universe. There might be uh, several ways to produce the dark age version, and actually we didn't really specify uh, which uh, which method, which production method, um, which we want to take in the, our first paper. But uh, in our second paper, uh, this is what we are working with the second paper, and we want to take the coherent dark age version production through the misalignment mechanism. So let's first take a very brief look at the misalignment mechanism in the coherent scalar case. The coherent means, of course, the, it's only the function of time, not of position. And this misalignment mechanism is a popular production mechanism of a coherent scalar field like the QCD action. This is the equation of motion, and this is the energy density. So the the rough story of the misalignment is the following. The inflation makes the phi spatially homogeneous. And the initially, Hubble friction is large, which makes the phi frozen and its energy density constant. But when the friction decreases sufficiently, I mean, like comparable or below the M phi, the coherent phi oscillation begins around its potential minimum. The oscillator has the Yes. Uh, would you explain more about this coherent oscillation? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Well, yeah. which which aspect did you mean? I mean, basic aspect. Okay. Um. There's not much really to say about, it, but let me put. Okay, although the this uh, misalignment mechanism. Uh, it's a sort of the generally used for any scholar or even the vector version, I will say. But uh, uh, if you talk about the QCD case, uh, there is no potential in the QCD before the temperature gets below the lambda QCD. Then there's instant effect that leaves the potential. I mean, in the in the this radial direction. So now the, I mean, depending on your log, in in most cases you will be in the minimum. But in some cases, you might end up with some non-zero phi value. And, and the, since the H is so large, you're stuck. I mean, the, there's so, so large friction. You stay there, it's frozen. So your energy density is uh, constant. But uh, as the universe cools down, the Hubble friction, I mean, Hubble parameter uh, decreases. And when it's uh, uh, smaller than the M5, then then the, the friction is uh, relatively small. So now it starts to roll and it oscillate. And this oscillation is basically the, the, the source of the energy density. We are fine. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Well, how do you guarantee the oscillation is coherent? So it's oh, all the- The coherent simply means that it is uh, Space, I mean, it is the function of time. Mm -hmm. And that what makes it that what makes that possible is the inflation. The spatial, the inhomogeneous is just inflated away. 
and you mm. end up with just a you know, single value. That's how you get it. There's actually the um, another layer of the story that is uh, like the quantum fluctuation. And there's a little, uh, not really flat part that gets out of the horizon and come back later. And I, I, and, and I, I, I heard and I know a little bit about it, but I don't understand them very well uh, to tell you more about that. But this is the sort of the basic story and I'm just uh, taking this basic version. This around the mechanism. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So, um, so again, the one of the interesting point is the oscillator has the zero pressure. So, uh, it means uh, it's behaving in the non-relativistic matter in the energy density scales is the a to d minus three. That's how that's how the this is color can be a non-relativistic dark matter, despite of which a very light uh, mass, like the 10 to the minus six electron volt of the QCD action. Okay, so this is a sort of the popular model for the uh, scalar. Now let's look at the coherent uh, um, vector version oscillation case. So before the oscillation, I mean, I mean, sorry, before the inflation, the vector fields are in the random direction over the space, but uh, during and uh, after the inflation, we can have the only one aligned direction in the visible, in our visible universe, let's say it is the X, I mean, the C component. Okay. This is the equation of motion and uh, we just follow the same procedure as the scalar part. We have the zero mode that's a spatially homogeneous, that's at least the dominant. I mean, I'm not saying this is the only mode, but this is at least the dominant, and that's what it takes. And uh, since it is uh, uh, now, I mean, uh, coherent because of the inflation, you can take it as a function of time only. And if you plug in this to the equation of motion, you'll find that the, the zero component X should be zero, and the, the other part, this, uh, G component of the X vector has the same similar form as the, the, the scalar case. And this is the energy density of your X gauge version. Now, here is the what uh, things start to differ from the scalar case. Unlike the scalar case, the low X is highly suppressed by this scale factor, which is one over two A squared. You can see this term doesn't exist in the uh, scalar case. But in the vector version case, we have this uh, scale factor squared suppression. And uh, it is hard to retain this uh, um, dark gauge version density through the inflation because uh, through the inflation, the if typical E folding is uh, 60, which is the exponential suppression, which means the naive misalignment mechanism does not really work for the sizable vector version production. That's the situation of the misalignment mechanism for the vector version. But that's when the mass of the X gauge version is a constant. In the gauge the quintessence model, the vector version mass is a function of the phi. I mean, it's increasing as the phi increases. So, and the phi can actually increase by many orders of the magnitude, which means the gauge version mass can also increase by many orders of the magnitude, which can possibly overcome the suppression by the scale factor in the last page. So it is a little preliminary result, but uh, it seems to us the misalignment mechanism with a mass varying vector version, at least in the quintessence model, may work to produce a sizable vector version energy density. And this is the parameter space, the constraint, the constraint, the constraint, and this blank region survives. Okay, so that will be the, our upcoming paper. Okay, uh, now, uh, yeah, sure. Ah, sure. uh, uh, so did you also consider the the the, the back reaction of 
apply to the inflaton background uh, dynamics in this case? Um, I don't know which back reaction you mean, but uh, maybe, I mean, the, this one is the, we, we, we gave a con uh, condition that the uh, X energy density should be uh, much smaller than the inflaton energy density. Otherwise, the inflation, inflation would not would not occur. So this is the back reaction that we considered. But what about a, the low what, phi? Low phi. Oh, you mean the dark energy? Yeah. OK. Um, that's actually the interesting part. And in we, we, we consider them, of course. We consider them. Uh, it's a little bit complicated story. And we better talk about it in the, some other time. I mean, the, the, that okay. needs a lengthy discussion. But uh, I can tell you that. I mean, I mean, the, we basically we studied like the before the like uh, before the inflation era, and go through the inflation and uh, considered all the effect of the the natural people's potential and the, this VGH, which gives you some interesting physics actually. And uh, we found the surviving solutions. Okay. Okay. Sure. So sorry, could you go back us right? So here, what if H I N F? Oh, that's the Hubble um, parameter the inflation error. Okay, so why does it matter? In this, why does it matter? Yeah, in this misalignment mechanism. Uh, if I understand correctly, you are now considering the production of a vector boson from, from Scala, right? During the quick tense yeah, evolution, right? Yes. And why the information of inflation plays important role? Because here? we are going through the inflation. I mean, the, the point is, this suppression is huge when you go through the inflation. It's the 60 E folding. And yeah, the, so you mean the initial abundance of the ozone is very, very suppressed, right? Initial abundance of what? Of vector boson. Yes. So that's why you are saying that the H inf is very important for the calculation of abundance. Yes. Is that what? It, okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So wait for the our second paper, and then we will see the all the I main. That are the very stories inside. Okay, so now you wanna um, briefly talk about the implication of the model on the evolution of the universe. So I wanna show several plots to illustrate how the things evolve in this gauge the continuous model. Uh, here we are not really trying to explain something. We just wanna talk about how the dark energy sector can be affected by the by its own gauge symmetry. And the one thing I want to mention is, although the X may have a sizable Rayleigh density through the misalignment mechanism, we still want to, I mean, the, we want to assume it as a subdominant dark matter, like the, say, less than 10% of the Rayleigh density of the dominant cold dark matter. And it's because the, the mass of the X gauge version uh, still changes at, even after the matter radiation equality. That's after it starts to behave as the the cold dark matter. And the, the, we are not sure if the large fraction of the mass varying dark matter would be consistent with the CMB and the other observations. Um, unless we come up with uh, some complicated potential, we didn't really do the CMB fitting, although we, we plan to do at some point. So there's some the uncertainty here, but uh, that's the reason that we wanted uh, subdominant dark matter. Okay, so having that said, um, the dynamics of the phi, the quintessence, and the X dark gauge boson changes drastically when the hierarchy between the these message and the Hubble parameter change over the time. Okay. 
So um, here the green is the Hubble parameter that's decreasing over the time. And uh, the blue is the quintessence mass. The X is the dark age version mass. So you can see the, both the mass of the phi and the mass of the X gauge version uh, changing by orders of magnitude over the cosmic evolution. Okay. The, as the mass changes, sort of the stage changes. I mean, the, in this first stage, when the both the mass of the phi and the mass of the X are smaller than the Hubble parameter, both of them are frozen because of the large Hubble friction. In the second stage, you can see that the, um, now the phi mass is larger than the H. So now phi lowers down the potential, but the MX is still lower than the H. So X is frozen. In the third stage, both of them are larger than the H. Now X is in the coherent oscillation, being a dark matter, and the phi rolls. So there are three different stages. And this is the normalized density of the phi. The, the blue is the um, phi density uh, over the CDM. The, it's not the X gauge version, it's the, the other component, the main dark matter component, energy density. It shows the fric fraction. And uh, the orange is the X gauge version case. Uh, in the first stage, the low X scale stage, the A to the minus two which is still frozen. Uh, in the second stage, it's uh, frozen, but now each mass MX is changing because the phi is uh, moving and the MX is basically given by the value of the phi. In the third stage, the low X scale stage the MX A to the minus three, and the MX is still changing because phi is changing. And uh, if you look at the, the present time, the A equals to one, you can see that uh, um, we picked up, I mean, the, we chose the example so that the X gauge boson fraction is about only 10% of the CDM and the phi is about uh, three times of the CDM, so it's the dark energy. The, the roughly it's the same, the correct uh, composition. Mm -hmm. And the, another interesting thing to notice uh, here in the in the stage one and two, the low X is uh, subdominant compared to the low X. Yes, I mean the low phi. Sorry, but the here, from here to around here, the low X is uh, uh, larger, which is slightly larger than the low phi, which means the the gauge potential, which is a similar order of the low X is now the important quantity. It is sizable during this period. So uh, if you look at the phi, it looks like it's uh, largely following the typical quintessence track. I mean, if you compare this, the phi excursion to the uncoupled quintessence, I mean, it, it's a little hard to see, but this black solid curve is the uncoupled quintessence track. Yes. And they basically overlap in the stage one and two and in the latter part of the universe. But around here, there is a little difference. That's because the V gauge is large uh, in this region, as I mentioned here. And when V gauge is large, basically there is a, a kind of the interesting phenomena like the oscillation like the phi oscillates around the minimum of the potential until this V gauge redshifts away later, like here, and then phi gets back to the tracking solution. And this can be clearly seen if you look at the um, equation of state of this phi, yeah? It's just the, uh, the function of the phi dot and the potential. And since the phi is, uh, oscillating around the minimum of the potential, you can see there is a lot of the, uh, the trajectory of the oscillations in this equation of state. 
And of course, at the end of the day, the V gauge uh, red shift away, and it restores the tracking solution. Okay, so now we wanna uh, make a few remarks about the potential uh, resolution of the Hubble tension in this kind of model. So as we all know that in the modern days, we measure the Hubble constant in basically two different ways. The one is the feeding the CMB data to the Lambda CDM model. It is very precise, but it is model dependent. Another one is basically the same method that Owen Hubble used, the standard candles with the red shirts. We are just doing it with a Hubble Space Telescope. This is less precise, but it is model independent, the direct. It is about the late universe uh, direct uh, measurement. The problem is uh, that these two measurements show some discrepancy in the earlier universe, in the early universe uh, favors like the 67 in some unit, while the direct measurement of the late universe indicates 73 in the same unit. So this discrepancy in the Hubble constant between the early and the late universe or the model dependent one or the direct and the direct one or the less, uh, yeah, that one is called the Hubble tension and it is regarded as a potential hint of the new cosmology beyond the lambda CDM. So now if you wanna address the Hubble tension with the dark energy, uh, which is one of the popular uh, direction to uh, approach the Hubble tension issue. There is an important constraint from the baryon acoustic oscillations. The angular size of the sound horizon, which is the distribution of the dominant energy spike in the CMB, it is well measured and it is about uh, one degree. And the uh, it is basically the ratio of the sound horizon to the core moving distance. I mean, this angle theta here, which is one degree, is basically the ratio of this sound horizon to the, the core moving distance to the sound horizon. And the sound horizon is basically the early universe physics. You can see it covers the redshift from the GS to the infinity. The GS is the uh, basically the same with the last uh, scattering. And the, this the core moving distance is the late universe physics. The, the reddish is from zero to the last scattering. So they are, this, they are clearly different error. And, and this angular size is the observed quantity. And unless, I mean, the, in the dark energy uh, is dom becomes dominant only in the late universe, unless you want to introduce something uh, something big in the early universe. Uh, so if you assume no changes in the sound horizon, which means no changes in the early universe physics, the core moving distance to the last scattering should remain intact when you introduce a new dark energy model. So uh, what you want is basically uh, keeping the core moving distance unchanged while we take a larger H0 value uh, that can resolve the Hubble tension. I mean, the CMB prefers the smaller value, but the direct measurement, uh, which is model independent, prefers the larger value. So if you take the larger value and can still satisfy the CMB, et cetera, then you basically resolve the Hubble tension. So uh, if you wanna take the larger H0, which means the Hubble parameter in the present universe should be larger than the lambda CDM, then it should be compensated by a smaller H in the uh, recent past to keep this uh, comorbid distance uh, intact. And because the, you know, the Hubble parameter is basically the proportional to the square root of the energy density and the energy density, um, scales with uh, a to the minus three, one plus w. So it demands the dark energy equation of state w 
to be less than minus one, smaller than the lambda CDM value, so that it can cover like that. The um, but the, if you remember the original quintessence case, the W is actually uh, the opposite direction. It is actually larger than the minus one, which means if you take the uncoupled quintessence model, uh, it worsens the Hubble tangent, which is already five sigma in the lambda CDM, but the uncoupled quintessence has even larger uh, sigma. I don't know the value, but it's worsened. And if the interacting dark energy model can provide the effective W, uh, it's the, uh, sorry, I think it should be less than minus one, sorry. Uh, it may elevate the Hubble tangent like this. I mean, the, this kind of red curve, which is the wished for, uh, needs the W less than minus one. But at this point, I want to thank uh, Eloy Colgan at Sogan University for telling me about this, that, uh, yeah, that was very helpful. Okay, so now, uh, what is the equation of the state for the effective dark energy in the gauge quintessence model? And the, this is it. The, basically, the minus one plus uh, some complicated thing. But the, this is uh, basically following this uh, sort of procedure that was developed for the dark energy dark matter interacting model uh, by these authors. You can um, basically, I mean, the, the thing is that the, our dark matter has the cold dark, I mean, the dominant dark matter, but also X, which has the mass changing. So the usual equation of state doesn't really work. The, the proper procedure for this is you first take the effective dark matter density for the constant mass with the A minus the three scaling. So that you are so basically we are taking the normal dark matter part and take it as the effective dark matter density, and the remaining mass varying part is absorbed in the effective dark energy density. So this is our effective dark energy, uh, which is satisfied the Friedman equation. So this is our effective uh, the equation of uh, state in our model. So uh, this plot shows the, a few cases of the effective W, the effective dark energy in our model. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so the different colors um, indicate the different X fraction in the dark matter density. The yellow is the, like the one percentage the orange is like 10% and the red is about 30%. And since uh, our um, MX is increasing, MX dot is uh, larger than zero, that means the MX is smaller than MX zero, the present time value. So this entire term is negative. So it helps to get a smaller W effective. So it is already quite smaller. I mean, it is smaller uh, compared to the um, uncoupled quintessence. And it can be even lower than the lambda CDM, which is the W minus one, uh, when the, this fraction is pretty large. Okay. So, so this is self actually the uh, sort of the elevate the Hubble tangent, but whether this value is actually compatible with uh, CMB and all the thing, uh, we need some numerical fitting to make sure. So I would say this is potentially the resolution, but uh, not confirmed. Okay, so time to conclude. Um, we introduced the first gauge symmetry model for a popular quintessence dark energy scalar field. The interaction between the quintessence scalar and the gauge boson brings many interesting features to the universe evolution. And the mass varying effect of the dark gauge boson may overcome the problem of the vector boson misalignment mechanism. And the Hubble tension may be elevated, although we need some uh, quantitative study to make sure. And, uh, I think the what our study is uh, uh, about this, I think it serves as a proof of concept that even the dark energy sector physics can be studied using a gauge symmetry. 
it's the, it's the gauge interaction with the dark energy. So uh, my, mess, my, my, my take home message might be that it is about time to investigate the governing symmetry in the dark energy sector. Then we can use all kinds of skills, methods, and the models we developed for the dark matter symmetry in the, here in the dark energy. So personally, I see the, a lot of research opportunity in the future. Uh, someday, if we achieve a complete model of the universe, then I would bet that we'll see more symmetries in that model. I mean, more than the standard symmetries. So that's it. And, uh, thank you for listening. Question? Maybe that's <laughs> uh, Actually, I have one very nice question. So how we can distinguish this? Your model to the, the, the original quintessence model, but can we from the observation, for example, can we detect the X from some observation or? It's actually something that uh, we are trying to, the, I mean, the, the, that's one of the things that we are uh, working on. The, I mean, this, uh, if you remember this uh, um, basic parameter space constraint, the quantum correction basically, the constraint, the coupling so tiny which is why we didn't really uh, include this uh, uh, interaction term in the Boltzmann equation. But uh, it is actually there, although we didn't include it because it's a uh, smallness. But you actually, the, but uh, we sort of took the sort of the conservative approach. So I think that the GX can be actually pretty large. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I take it back. Uh, <laughs> larger than what's constrained here, potentially. And that uh, we are actually the working on some Potential, potential signals of this uh, dark energy with a uh, gauge coupling. But uh, it's a little too early to discuss about that openly. So I think it, I think it might be possible. Yeah, I, I have one question. Maybe it's very silly, but so when you talked about this uh, solving Hubble tension by early dark energy domination, so is it, uh, I mean, is it very generic in this kind of quintessence, quintessence model or it's like, it's true for any uh, dark energy, I mean, any dark, early dark energy dominated scenarios? Uh, first, our model is not really the early dark energy model scenario. It is the late, uh, in late new physics scenario. I mean, the, but actually, the, there is, I mean, there's some, I mean, the, among the, what we are currently working on actually has some possibility to have the early dark energy changes, but the, that's not what we published yet. So, in this scenario, that, I mean, the, the changes are made only in the late universe. And this the BAO constraint is, because this is observed quantity, and since we are not changing the early universe, the late universe physics quantity, the co-moving distance to the sound horizon should be intact, although we are changing the late universe. There is, of course, the another direction that changes the early universe, uh, thing like the early dark energy models, etc. But at this point, our model does not belong to that. And the, those models should deal with how to um, address this, uh, I mean, the sound horizon constraint. It's up to oh. them, yeah. Oh. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Any other question? Any other question from Zoom? Well, can I thank ask one question? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I'm not quite understanding how this interacting dark energy model can really uh, alleviate uh, Hubble tension. So... Um, yes, so the I should say that this uh, idea is not really the uh, the I mean our original idea to basically 
um, the well, I mean, it's published by other people the, here and there. Um, so the point is that the, we want a larger H0, which is the sort of indicated here, it's like 73-ish. And uh, to have the larger H0, but still keep this mm -hmm. co-moving distance intact, there should be some change in the H of zero, H of G from the lambda CDM. And the, 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 the right direction is, uh, it should be compensated by the, by taking the smaller value in the range universe around here, which is the, the figure is a little exaggerated, but the, the qualitatively, it should be smaller value around here, which means the, uh, the W for the dark energy, I mean, the major component should be negative. My, uh, smaller than minus one, so. So that's what you're trying. But uh, this is not our idea. I mean, this is uh, just a known idea. Hmm. Is it also possible to have W greater than minus one? And I mean, in, in this interacting dark energy model, is it also possible for W to be uh, greater yes. than minus one? So, for example, in this scenario, I mean, the, in this uh, the example, the orange, it is larger than minus one. Actually, making it smaller than minus one is pretty challenging. We had to use the rather uh, the large value for the fraction of the, the X dark matter, the, despite the I mean, potential risk of the compatibility with the CMB data, et cetera. But uh, we didn't really do the numerical fitting yet. And the, and the, the this is for our, for this this particular scenario, but the gauging the quintessence thing does not really the constrain the model to be unique in this way, and the, you can actually the bring other things. And then I think there is a, I mean, if you basically if you increase the degree of freedom, then you can satisfy those expected data relatively easily, and I think it might be possible. So. So short answer is yes, it can be larger than minus one, but it could be even and, smaller and than minus one. And still alleviate the habilitation? Uh, it, it still alleviates the habilitation compared to the uncoupled quintessence, but not uh, compared to the uh, relatively lambda speaking, I see. Right, yes. I see. Thank you very much. Sure, pleasure. Any further question? If not, let's thank Speaker again. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you so much for having me.